Okay, so this is kind of what I was touching on briefly as a, as a side note, a little bit prematurely, is that in a lot of the research that I've started to do, you know, first starting to look at Sumer, and then as we, you know, do shows like Ancient Aliens now in its ninth season, I think we, I just shot some uh, 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 series episodes uh, last week. And, um, you know, it's interesting, the more and more we look at these sites, Gobekli Tepe or Indonesia Valley, or now we're gonna be looking deeply into China, the further and further back we go, the more complex the sites become. So it's really starting to tip the scholars thinking on their head, like, well, how does this happen? We don't explain. And, you know, they look at individual case scenarios from different cultures, but they don't look at all of the cultures and try and look at the bigger picture. So the bigger picture from my standpoint is all of the cultures, uh, Central America, Mayan, Aztec, South America, Central, and uh, some of these locations. And then we had the Egyptians and uh, Sumerian in Iraq, ancient Iraq. All of them went to great lengths to monitor the heavens and track the movements of the stars. And they seem to be aware of a much larger cycle of time. So what I'd like to do is kind of explain that to you in, in, in our session today, is that several different cultures use a reference of even Greek Roman, uh, different references, both the same, meaning called it the great year. And you can see here that there are different cultures. Uh, the outer one is uh, Greek Roman, most commonly known today as uh, the iron, bronze, silver, golden age. And then we have the, the, the Hindu, uh, and we have the Satya Yuga, the Treta Yuga, the Dropara Yuga, and then the Kali Yuga. And so then in, in the golden track in the inner part there, we have the symbolic references of the cycle. Now, folks, what's really interesting about this is that it doesn't matter what continent you go to, China, Africa, India, Americas, we all have the same knowledge of this breakdown of the heavens into a divisible 12 parts. And there seems to be a mathematical breakdown that they use to calculate when events are gonna take place and things seem to happen on a repeating cycle. The kicker of this is this cycle is a 24,000 year cycle. So what there seems to be happening is a repeating of a lot of the events that have already taken place. Meaning if you look at this image here, 2000 AD was you know roughly just coming out of the Iron Age and into the Bronze Age or unfortunately quite a bit away before we're into the golden age again. But you can already see and feel these changes happening. 2012 wasn't a, a marker as an age of time ending for all time. It was an age of time that was the Aquarian age, or excuse me, it was a, a time of the age of Pisces ending and we entering the age of Aquarius. It's just an astronomical marker of those 12, 12 divisions of the heavens broken down. The ancients used this systematically and built structures and monitored the heavens, which I'll show you very accurately, and knew that somehow there were influences in the universe or in our solar system that caused the rise and fall of civilization here on Earth. So I'm not getting too specific on that part, because I know it's a heavy concept. Just understand that a lot of the great cultures out there realized that there was this larger cycle of time. Today, we call it the procession of the equinox. What I'm gonna show you tonight is new information that spins this information into a more clear light. All the latest data for calculating the procession of the equinox, the old model is called the lunar solar model, where they basically say that because of the moon's influence and the way we orbit, there's this squishing of the earth and it causes a retarding of about one degree every 72 years. So that around 2000 years later, boop, we're facing a different North Star. The variables and complications in this lunar solar theory are so complex for torsion and motion and torque and all this. Much more simplified version has come out, less variables, and it makes a lot more sense. Our solar system is not a static solar system where the sun is sitting there <laughs> and we're spinning around it. No, our sun is actually moving through space. 
I say that because all of the other solar systems that we've been viewing with our telescopes, you know, looking at other external parts of the, of, of the galaxy, we see what's called a binary system, very prevalent, that most other solar systems we film have somewhere between two to three, sometimes four or even more suns and different planets all intertwined in this amazing dance. So the idea that there's a binary sun, two suns, is nothing new. And all the evidence has been stacking up from topics like Planet X or Nibiru that, the, the, that can support that model by us having a second sun. So there's a lot of evidence, not only in our modern technology and science around a Planet X, an additional sun, well beyond the Oort cloud, which is another asteroid belt far beyond Pluto, but there's a lot of evidence to suggest that we have a second sun. But it's a dark star now. It's a failed sun. It's a brown dwarf. It's not emanating a lot of, uh, of heat or light, but it is a big gravity source. So there's a large amount of information that shows we are actually a binary solar system. Now, folks, that doesn't mean two suns sitting stagnant in space, right? Let me get back on camera. <laughs> that means binary. They're in orbit around each other. So when the suns get close to each other, we spin up faster. And then as they get farther away, it slows down. This seems to be a 24,000 year cycle. And when the suns are at their closest point, there seems to be a connection with us being in the golden age. When the suns are at their farthest point, we're in the dark ages. There's something that happens, and I'm only gonna try and give you the best tangible examples, is think about the sun's energy and how it affects us. Just one sun, it makes all the flowers and things spring to life towards the direction of the sun. Everything wakes up and enjoys the energy of the sun. Everything slows down without the sun. Now, what if we introduce the electromagnetism or some other energy sources from another sun, a foreign body of electromagnetism that gives us awakening or does something to us that we just don't understand yet? It seems to be the case, folks, that all the ancients were aware of some type of other energy that was naturally available in these golden ages when we're in this other cycle of time. And so it might be that we built a lot of these monuments to harness this energy as we started to dip out of the golden age. Heavy topics, but I at least want you to understand the scenario of some of the things I'm trying to convey in today's lecture. Okay. So as you can see here, it's kind of an illustration that most of the uh, stars that we see in our solar system today are in fact binary. This uh, information can be challenged at, at an academic level. My partner runs something called the Binary Research Institute here at uh, well, uh, Newport Beach and has used the same NASA or you know, personnel that would be working for daytime at JPL or Goddard Space Center or uh, some conglomerate of NASA. But at nighttime, I'm freelance and crunch the data for a different model using their same astrophysics uh, and mathematics uh, background. So the Binary Research Institute, which can be Google, has produced a wealth of information looking at the scientific aspects for the precession of the equinox based on it being, again, this larger cycle of time that seems to repeat and understanding that if our sun, grasp this folks, if our sun is in orbit around another sun, that means we're moving through space. We're orbiting the sun. So if the sun's moving through space, we're going along for the ride. That explains a whole other view of why we see a different star passing over us every 2000 years. It's not because there's a wobble in the moon. It's because our orientation is actually changing in three dimensional space as we travel in this binary orbit with the sun around our other sun. So heavy concept, but makes a much more logical approach based on all the current data. Again, so visual representation that all the ancients broke down the heavens into 12 parts so that uh, you were able to visually look at the heavens as a large celestial clock. Now, it didn't take a lot of science to actually know what age you were in. The ancients had a very simple way. You could go out right at the time just before sunrise, look towards the sun, and whatever constellation that the sun is, is going to be you know, rising in front of, you're in the age of Aquarius, the age of Pisces, based on the constellation that was behind the sun. So they had a very easy way of understanding and tracking this time 
but went to great lengths to memorialize it in different evidence edifices and actually large monuments that just align perfectly tracking those. Various cultures uh, from around the planet seem to have the same understanding and use the same symbolic references uh, to, de to, uh, to denote this understanding. Let me give you a real world example. If you drive around the United States, especially in more of the middle parts of the United States, you'll see on the back of people's cars, what looks like the symbol of a fish, and sometimes a little cross inside that fish. Folks, before Jesus, that symbol, a fish, symbolized the age of Pisces, an astronomical symbol, which cultures preceding the time of Jesus used the symbol of a fish to denote, to denote the age of Pisces. The age of Pisces, symbolically being a fish, coordinates with the time of Jesus and his reign that just took place for the last 2,000 years. Spiritually speaking, we've crossed now into the age of Aquarius and everyone sees there's a new awakening and understanding around these spiritual topics. That's why at 41 years old, I'm talking to you on a web conference about this information. Because when I was 20, just in that time period, 20 years, this information was taboo. I could not get a degree talking about this information. This is not still accepted in academic circles, but everyone knows the truth. So the circle of information continues to grow. And it's very interesting to look at how all the ancients around the world seem to go through the same cycle of, we go to great lengths of learning this in the golden age and then lose it all in the dark ages and start to relearn it. I'll show you some more specific examples of this, but just again, jumping off topic because it's popping into my head. You can see the track record of some of this astronomically that if you look at the, the knowledge of, let's say are orbiting the sun, right? So the Sumerians and the Egyptians all had very accurate knowledge that they knew we orbited the sun. I mean, they had very accurate knowledge of our position of the heavens going back thousands of years. But now we get to the time of Copernicus and Galileo. We somehow, by that time, have lost the knowledge <laughs> about us orbiting the sun. And they're just relearning it and proving to everyone else, like, guys, look, it's, you know, we orbit the sun. And they're like, no, no, it's not possible. Vatican is couldn't be lying. So we can see just in that time frame of how we didn't know a lot of the information about orbiting the sun. We relearned it. And now today, of course, it's a standard norm. Just as we're learning about this lost cycle of time, there are certain variables about the information we're learning about ancient cultures that the time of the Sumerians, and the Egyptians, this was all well known. Copernicus, Galileo, we come out of the dark ages, We've just been relearning all of this stuff, folks, and it's gonna to continue to happen. Okay, so as you can see that based on a lot of the evidence, there seems to be an understanding that we're actually in a binary orbit. Now, if you just calculated the sun's moving at one speed, you know, there'd be discrepancies in the orbit. So we have to calculate the fact that the gravitational size based on the weight and size of this other sun, which we haven't validated even what it is, is it Cirrus A and B? Maybe, we don't know. But that orbit causes it to go like this. It speeds up as they get closer and then slows down as they get farther apart. So this is something that we're still looking at and tracking. But a lot of the ancient cultures, again, went to great lengths to convey their astronomical information. Here's an edifice of a Sumerian stella that shows various astronomical symbols. Here's the great uh, renowned uh, Tower of Babel incident. But let's look closer, folks, at the top. And what do we see? Two suns, a knowledge of two suns. And, and, and a lot of the ancient cultures seem to speak of the idea and an understanding that the sun had a twin and that there was two suns. Okay. Now, again, so when we start to look at some of this Egyptian information about their astronomical data, they were very accurate in being able to convey large concepts. Hieroglyphics are very interesting. I look at I recommend anyone look at the work of uh, Dr. Laird Scranton. Laird Scranton, he makes Egypt tall. He makes understanding hieroglyphics very easy. A hieroglyphic, just one symbol alone, is like an acronym, like CIA, Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, you know, lots of laughs, right? LOL. You know, um, these things are acronyms where one hieroglyphic is an acronym. It has multiple word meaning. So when you see 
hieroglyphics strung together, they are actually conveying multiple words with multiple meanings. Very ingenious way of communicating. One of the things that they left us was this stella on top of the Dendera wall on the ceiling, which actually shows a view of the heavens from at least 8,000 years ago. Now, what's interesting about this view is that they show all of the current constellations that we're aware of, but many others that we're not aware of. A much older view of the heavens, which we still can't even identify what they were seeing, but we know for a fact, based on our own knowledge of how the solar system moves, this is a very old view, around 8,000 years old. Here's an up-close uh, version. You can see the detail in the design. Now, what's interesting is you can use uh, an iPad or various other programs today, and it will tell you running star charts, redshift, um, various other programs that are free, and it'll tell you, oh, look, if you're in North America, go out tonight at 9 p.m. and you'll see Orion 27 degrees to the north. Well, you can run these programs not only forward in time to know where the constellations are going to be, but using that same model back in time. And it turns out that a lot of the alignments that take place, for instance, the three great pyramids of Giza, they align perfectly with the Orion constellation at 10,500 BC. I think I'm probably going to have some images of that. But a lot of the data seems to explain why they had knowledge of a much older epoch of time. Either they existed or that they understood somehow that there were these cycles of time that were tracking it so accurately, they understood the movements of the heavens far beyond what we do today. Now, the Dark Ages, unfortunately, is that time frame where it's kind of symbolically shown like we see in Game of Thrones, right? Everything's about the physical presence. Hoarding, what can I physically gain? No spiritual, like, you're like, hey, man, understand peace and loving. They'd be like, I take your stuff. So unfortunately, the Dark Ages were an age of very little spiritual understanding. And that's something that we've just dipped out of coming out of the Dark Ages. The Golden Age is kind of this understanding that there seems to be a time when man reaches a, a height. The ancient Hindus say that man reaches a point where he's actually able to interpret God. We're nowhere near that. So there's such a leap in understanding, and I, I probably have an image of this, but I'm saying it ahead of time, so forgive me. To understand this 24,000 year cycle, we have to understand how just insignificantly small our lifespan is at 100 years. So an analogy of that would be, there's, a, there's an insect here on earth called the mayfly, and it only lives 24 hours. Um, its whole gestation period of birth to death, 24 hours. So if a mayfly is born on a cloudy, windless day and is sitting on a leaf, and another mayfly comes up, and he's like, you know, I've heard of this stuff called the sun, sunshine, or wind. I don't see it. And they both die. Now, that doesn't mean that the sun and the wind don't exist, right? All of the ancient cultures went to great lengths to explain that they all had these heightened states and were tracking when they were in that heightened state and when they will return, when the gods will return, when they will be in alignment again. So it seems to have a very deep impact on our current understandings if we can only get our heads around it. But there seems to have been a time when we were at such a heightened state that not only could we interpret God, but maybe we were also interacting with other beings interdimensionally, extraterrestrial. Uh, and as we dip back into these darker ages, of course, you know, our friends in space, as an example, wouldn't be like, oh, let's go talk to the monkeys. Let's give them another cycle. And, the, you know, they, they evolve again. So it's, it's very interesting to see how there's this connection with all the ancient cultures with these higher beings. And now today we're looking around going, well, where are they? So maybe there is just this track record that seems to be a cycle that takes place as to when we have the interactions and us being the right, literally, spiritual mind frame to be ready to globally accept this type of knowledge. Okay, we already saw that image. So other cultures, again, track this knowledge, even Arabic texts, uh, various cultures that had this understanding and recorded it and uh, looked at this different view that there was a, an importance to understanding the position in this larger cycle of time. Uh, various cultures recorded on various types of technology from metal plates to you know, papyrus or stone. 
the Sumerian culture, one of my favorite cultures, uh, had that uh, ingenious method of reverse carving images so they could press it into various objects and leave multiple imprints. This one I just thought was interesting because what you see here is actually a symbolic reference of Earth and the main uh, the, the symbol of Nibiru, essentially. So here we have the planet Nibiru, which is like the home world of the gods of, uh, of, the, of the Sumerians, the Anunnaki. We have a cross and, there, and it's large moon, Kingu, the moon of Nibiru. And then we have Earth, the seven dots of Earth, the sacred number seven, Ki. Uh, Earth is always rep represented as the seven dots and it, and it has its moon with it, its crescent moon. So I always thought that was just kind of an interesting seal. Now, what's interesting about the Sumerian culture, again, is their style of writing. They had this cuneiform script, which, again, was a kind of a large overdrive screwdriver, oversized screwdriver. They would turn it and twist it in the clay and make these characters. They'd also write sometimes on semi-precious stones um, and uh, recorded not only daily events of, like, I trade you so many hay, you know, things of barley for a donkey, what have you, but they also recorded astronomical information and in some of these tablets uh they recorded information over thousands of years um, a lot of these tablets are actually on display in various museums and others are not on display meaning they're literally you know shoved in a in a drawer or uh, you know in a, in a locker there are literally thousands of tablets still in the louvre and in the british museum that just need the proper grants to you know access academically and translate there could be certain plants and penicillin and things that could help the body or things that we don't understand based on the wealth of information excuse me <laughs> wealth of information that they've uh, left us at, at, um, astronomically sorry for the feedback folks a little neck scratch um, now again other cultures have this knowledge of this larger cycle of time and the in the mines were a great example where they were put out of context with not fully understanding the right context, that their 2012 calendar didn't end in 2012. It was just an age ending, just like any clock will tick into a new time frame. So one of their calendars, they actually had three calendars, uh, three different ways how they track time. One of them was a long count calendar. It's more of like a prediction based calendar, excuse me. And what's interesting about their prediction based calendars, it made more long term predictions. They weren't always accurate. One of their Bakhtuns predicted a time frame for when their god, Kukul Khan, was going to return. The same time frame for Kukul Khan's return. One day, this huge ship with white sails and these people with gleaming armor and amazing wardrobes step off and greet the Mayans in a very honorable way. And they think it's Kukul Khan's crew. And they're like, wow, here we go. The gods have returned. Bring out the gold, bring out the women, bring out the food. You guys are in. Here you go. Have everything. Take our culture. And that's exactly what they did. And they took all of their Mayan codices and left us poor after burning everything and aggressively converting everybody to Christianity. So unfortunately, what we have is information left from various cultures that tap into this lost higher knowledge from the Golden Age, whether it be Mayan, Aztec, Hindu, Sumerian, African, Australian. They all seem to have been influenced by some lost great culture. Today, as a, an analogy, we would say there was an Atlantis, some great culture on a continent that sunk. Well, no, in fact, there was a great culture, but it probably was global and influenced all the cultures at that time. And so now all the great old ancient cultures that we have today, they all have a piece. They all have the same piece of being influenced by that great race, that great culture that uh, existed in our last golden age probably again 10,000 bc let's just roughly say 10 to 13,000 years ago something like that okay so the mayans again in their long count calendar the way they track time is just very advanced and understood larger cycles of time how we're just now starting to acknowledge and understand understand that the precession of the equinox probably isn't caused by a wobble it's caused by us being in a binary orbit and this, again, just changes our whole model for understanding how solar system events take place and our spatial awareness of what's going on around us. Here again, we can see another depiction of the winged disk and the conveyance of flight. And again, all over Egypt and various places, they used even simple methods uh, to watch as a sundial or track systems of time. 
Now, a lot of these sites might have been very simple, even some ones that are more complex. The Egyptians uh, went to great lengths also not only tracking these cycles of time, but showed their access or ways that they track the right times for them to take either the Pharaoh into their next journey or preparing the soul to go into this next phase or next dimension of existence. And a lot of these things, it's interesting folks, because the Egyptians have a 900 page book called the Egyptian Book of the Dead. The Mayans have similar information where they go to great lengths preparing the Pharaoh's knowledge uh, for the afterlife. There's something to this folks. Now, all of the information we have today, and I'm, I'm side noting again, that this is good stuff. There's something to the afterlife experience, near-death experiences. Um, there's someone named Raymond Moody, you can Google him, and near-death experiences where over 400 cases have been analyzed from different hospitals and doctors around the world, having patients describe the same near-death experience, the tunnel of light out of body and saw you moving me into the tunnel out of, a, out of the elevator, you were operating that machine, my mom was coming down here. There's just no way they could explain these things. The ancients seem to tap into this near-death experience knowledge much deeper than we do. They prepared the pharaohs and kings for something that seems to be possibly real, folks. I'm going to side bend on it just really quickly because it's, I think it's really cool. Um, I think there's something to the fact that they prepared them to the point where a lot of these tales in the Book of the Dead, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, or the Mayans' understanding is that the, 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 the king or the pharaoh would essentially be presented with a certain doorway and a being or challenges that they would have to go through that if they knew the right answer, they could pass into the next life and, and have kingship again, meaning be a king in this life and a king in the next. That sounds like a good deal. So a lot of the information though has similar lines of information. The Mayans, for instance, the king would have to go through a room of scorpions and know the right way to navigate and then a room of tarantulas, things of what, what have you. Um, but the same analogy for us is on North American Christianity views. It seems to be very heavy that it's good to, let's say, have someone like Jesus, uh, if you're a Christian, as an example. Again, I have respect for all religions. I was even raised Christian, but I take no stance to one. I look at all of them as channels of information. The Christian viewpoint is very interesting where it's like, take Jesus as your savior, because in the next life or the afterlife, he helps guide you, right? So Maybe there's something more to this that a lot of the kings and pharaohs, and even today, we're holding on to some piece of a knowledge that the only analogy I could give you is today, it's good to have a resume with strong people, it gets you a good job. Well, what if in the afterlife, you have strong people that have your back and it helps you get to where you want to go? Jesus is probably a great candidate. The pharaohs and kings seem to also retain and have knowledge of beings and others that they spoke to or asked to to watch their back so that when they transition into the afterlife, they had the right phrases, information to speak to them. It's very heavy, heavy information, but I think there is some substance to, as our knowledge expands into neurosciences and trying to understand more about this near-death near death experience that a lot of people have as we, you know, explore what happens when we die. <laughs> okay, now getting back on topic, again, a lot of the cultures seem to have this knowledge of astronomical information that just kind of dumbfounds modern astronomers. There are actually tribes in Africa, uh, the Dogon tribe, where they've been tracking astronomical movements of Cirrus A and B, a star system, for so long that it just dumbfounds modern astronomers. And it's so accurate that they just can't explain how they have this knowledge. The similarities that they have around Egyptian culture references for the Orion constellation and how they track the movements of the heavens seem to be very much in alignment, even though these cultures were separated by thousands of miles. Now, these people have held on to their cultural beliefs, even to this day, and have kind of been sheltered from technology, yet they have knowledge that a modern astrophysicist would actually be able to condone and accept. So a lot of the knowledge around this idea that we're a binary solar system raises questions to, well, what's the other candidate of our star system? Is it Cirrus A and B that could possibly be this, this other star system that has, let's say, planets around it, and we're in an orbit with Cirrus, so our sun and Cirrus are in this dance, and just like there's life around our sun, 
probably not just Earth, let's get real folks, Mars and other planets, but Cirrus A and B, some of its planets might be the origination of some of the life that came here and seeded our solar system. A lot of these cultures are talking about this and have a knowledge of Cirrus A and B being the home world for life. So another interesting thing we're looking into for season nine uh, of Ancient Aliens, which is kind of interesting, this is already part of my lecture, are the Wangina in Australia. All these references of these beings and, and different uh, shapes of characters that were explained to resonate all over Australia in this part called the Blue Mountains. And that the Wangina, these gods, assisted man and, and flew around the skies of Earth. And even to this day, the Blue Mountain Range, you can Google it, in Australia is a hot spot for UFO activity. So we have to wonder if, you know, there wasn't a time, again, when we were on our higher ages, that cultures were holding on to this knowledge of their interaction with these beings that somehow gave us this, this great interaction and knowledge. And all over these Aboriginal stones, uh, we see the depictions of characters we can't explain. Okay, now also, uh, when we start to look at some of these sites, just like Egypt, we can see just how accurately they've been able to convey a lot of their knowledge. Now, folks, you'll have to forgive me. Um, I believe I started my lecture at 1130. And uh, I'm going to stop in about 15 minutes to take questions and such. So I might just start speeding through a few of these slides just to convey my Just so you know, you have about 45 minutes left. So you Perfect. can take your time. Yes. Thank you. I've just been told I have a little bit more time. So I'll slow it down a little bit because I do still have about 100. 30 slides, 120 slides for you folks. Okay, so just understand here that when we also look at the sites like Giza, we can see that it's been very accurately tracked to have an alignment where over time it's drifted, but it seems to happen over time where these alignments take place. The last time Giza was in alignment with Orion was at 10,500 BC. So if the pyramids were built by the Egyptians in 2500 BC, somehow just like Dendera, right, it's 8,000 years older, showing reliefs of the sky accurately in Dendera, somehow they built the pyramids <laughs> to align 8,000 years, even before what, where they're said to have been now at 2,500 BC. More than likely, folks, you know, the Egyptian culture goes back much further, or it's piggybacking on cultures that existed in this era since the Golden Age. Let's talk about that, which is probably, you know, 10, 15,000 at most BC. But there's even going to be epochs of time beyond these. We just haven't found them yet. Most of those cultures, I would predict, if there was a betting pool, are going to be found on the southern and, uh, and Antarctic, north and uh, you know, north and south poles under the ice sheets. As uh, under pole shifts and times, there's probably lost cultures buried under miles of ice at this point. But all the all the structures we have today on the surface do show amazing astro astronomical alignments that go back to around this. 10,000 to 13,000 year range, 15,000 max. Giza is a great example of aligning, aligning to Orion, where when we roll back the clock, it's perfectly aligned to 10,500 BC. Okay, so when we look at some of the math around some of these pyramidal structures, we can see that they're definitely not just out of the box by chance um, look nice. There's definitely mathematical complexities being shown. Khufu and some of these other pyramids are just so perfectly aligned. They're not even, they're less than one degree off of true north. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. Now, some of the information and tools that we use today to look at the ancient astronaut theory and to date the true origins of these sites, despite modern academics' lack of just using simple tools like this, is to look at Giza as an example. The last time it was like this, meaning all the great tales show the pharaoh walking down the plank of the pyramid and standing at the foot of the Nile, getting on a little boat, going for a cruise, right? If we look at Giza today, we can see that here's the Nile on your right side of your screen, and the pyramids are way over here. Pharaoh's not stepping off onto the Nile. That means that geologically, the time it's taken for the Nile to meander from where the pyramids are all the way over here is thousands of years. That means that there was a time when these, the Nile being close to the pyramids is probably a lot older than what we currently understand today of Pharaoh's existence around 2500 BC. 
So what we can do, folks, is use geological data like this to say, wow, the, 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 the river has meandered several miles from where it should have been. And that's a geological change that we can track. Then we can also track the astronomical changes like you see here, right? Excuse me. Right. So astronomically, we can see when these alignments took place and see, well, why did they align at that date? And understand that some of these things like this show that the Nile meandering as far as it has is a, now a geological marker. We can have astrological and geological markers to show the true origins of some of these time, time frames for when we occupy these sites. Mesoamerica is another example. A lot of these sites around like Machu Picchu or Teotihuacan or Pumapunku that we look at today and are totally in amazement. Well, all of these cultures, here's Lake Titicaca, right? Here's Lake Titicaca. Now look at this. Here's Machu Picchu way up in the corner in Cusco, right? Look at that, folks. Geologically, what do you see? You see an ancient lake bed that unfortunately is a very low lake bed today. But all of those ancient sites, right on the edge of the lake. But that would have been thousands of years ago. So we can use geological data, just like I'm going to show you some on Mars, the same thing applies, that we can look all over the Earth, folks, and see that there's been changes geologically that have meandered rivers or shrunk in the lake over a period of time that just unfortunately always doesn't stack up with the modern views of, of these dating periods. Now, if we look over all, uh, Mesoamerica, over and over, we see outposts to monitor, to monitor the astronomical scene. Various pyramids and structures used for either ceremonial purposes at strategic times, like in Apocalypto. Anyone saw that movie Apocalypto, right? Where the, 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 the priest at the right time, the painted priest looks over at the king and he says, okay, you can do your thing. The eclipse is about to happen. They all used posts of ceremony or outposts to monitor things having to do with the movement of the heavens. Now, outside of the movement of the heavens, they went to great lengths to build these structures in a way that would withstand the tests of time. And they used something that we would call a mortarless technology. And all of these stones seem to have been, let's say, superheated. Um, if you take any stone and heat it to the point where it's almost like a magma state, like lava, Right then, it's like putty. You can shape it, and move it, maybe pour it into a like a mold and let it harden, and then it comes out as a brick. No big deal there, right? Well, folks, that's what we see all over these ancient sites: is the term vitrification. Vitrification is the side effect of once you've had a stone in a liquid magma or some somewhat magma state, and then you start doing hard cuts. There's this glassing effect on the surface that they call vitrification. So all over these sites like Pumapunku and Machu Picchu and Teotihuacan, we see large cut stones, deerite, bas uh, uh, basalt, and, and you know, granite, hard, hard to cut stones with intricate reliefs and patterns cut in them. And the only way to describe that is they were using some type of a large energy source that allowed them to just turn the stone right into putty. And then as you can see here, if I zoom in, they could literally just like with laser precision make poked holes at perfect points in the rock. Now, the only way that you could do this would be that you, you again, had somehow access to technology that would, would able to superheat the stone. Now, all over Pumapunku and some of these sites, you can see that there's cut stone with intricate patterns that, you know, you just can't imagine someone sitting there with a chisel and not only doing this once, but duplicating it over and over. Let me go back to that one for a minute. So the only thing that we can explain is that they had some type of a large energy source that allowed them to just cut these patterns or heat the stone to the point where they could just press a pattern right into the stone. Outside of that technology, what we also see them applying this heat, the ability to cut the stones, is to, uh, what you would call megalithic structures, like you see here. Baalbek in Lebanon is a great example where we have a quarry site where they were cutting these stones in perfect form, like blocks, and stacking them five miles away in Baalbek in Lebanon. We know that they took them here because several of the stones you can see actually cracked off, and so they left it. And just to give you an idea of the size of these stones, 
you can understand that these are literally trilithotons. They weigh hundreds of tons. I mean, they're huge. We have no ability today to cut a stone of that size out of the ground and transport it in one piece. Maybe we could break it up and transport it, but not as one solid object. And that's exactly what we see is these stones were cut and then transported until Baalbek is one location. Now, all of the ancient sites uh, seem to have a purpose that was related to the gods. Baalbek is not without reason. There's a great story in the Sumerian epics uh, where King Gilgamesh, when visiting this region, actually described seeing the gods descending and ascending, where you would see large pumes of smoke and fire and thunderous sound as the gods came and went from this location. So Baalbek, before all the cities were built on it, was essentially just a large space platform for landing on it. And these stones were essentially the base that still exists today. Now, we still even today have, you know, megalithic sites built on these locations, but the base was built at a much, a much earlier age. Okay, now a lot of these sites, again, have mathematical constructs built into them, which kind of raise a lot of questions. Stonehenge is no example. They were able to track the motions of the heavens and, and use this as a system of not only time, but being able to watch when the solstices would occur and understanding the various things that uh, took place in this movement while we were in this binary orbit, or at least being able to understand that there was a, a tracking of the, of the heavens and they were able to use this as a marker to track it. Um, various ways to look at Stonehenge, whether it be uh, based on the sun's angle or the placement of the stones themselves. Now, this speaks to the idea that many of these sites seem to be on what are called ley lines or a world energy grid of some sort where they're harnessing electromagnetic upwellings or there seems to be certain geodetic points where there's more of an upwelling of energy. And a lot of these sites are built to either harness that energy or are at key locations to monitor the heavens from those locations. The Mayans and the Aztecs all over South America are a great example we see over and over, over this type of an outpost that would allow them to kind of just, you know, have an unobstructed view of the heavens. And so they went to great lengths in memorializing when certain alignments took place. One of these is kind of infamous uh, around the god uh, Kukulkan, where when the sun hits the angle of this pyramid at the right day and time, we see this great effect where the serpent god is actually memorialized. So here is the pyramid, and then boom, at the right angle of time, we get this effect where now we have a serpent being displayed coming down the side of the pyramid, all due to just the sun hitting it. You know, that's just amazing. And even to this day, people gather by the thousands, you know, to, to memorialize this ceremonious event. But I mean, the ability to, to build this folks is I think off the charts. Do we see anything like that today, even in modern architecture where they're utilizing the angles of the sun to, you know, make a creature appear, if you will, it's pretty cool. So when we look at all of these sites, they seem to have a knowledge, even these sites themselves, these pyramids were laid out to be known as the Pyramid of the Sun, the Pyramid of the Moon, Pyramid of the Moon. Um, Eric von Daniken believes that these were all laid out in, in Mexico to actually emulate certain planets in the solar system. But the way they were built is just the same as the Giza pyramids with mathematical precision that can't just be by chance. And here we go again, so the Pyramid of Moon, Moon, Pyramid of Sun. It looks very ceremonial to have like these landing platforms all around this great square. I can almost see like ships sitting on them at some point in the past, perhaps. Uh, just something landing there and easily stepping down. Hello, my people. Uh, but we know that all these pyramids, again, were used for ceremonial purposes, and they seem to, again, represent possibly one pyramid for each planet or known solar system. Um, what's interesting about this is that, again, when we start to look at a lot of these sites in a pullback perspective uh, using Google Maps and satellite views, what we start to see is some interesting comparisons between how the ancients viewed their cultures and how new technology is allowing us to find where they strategically built a lot of their sites. Machu Picchu, Puma Punku, a lot of these sites have, let's just say, a strategic viewpoint. 
Okay. Um, what's also very interesting about a lot of these sites, again, is the technology and the way they built these sites to just withstand the test of time, mortarless technology. The way that these stones are fit together in such a way, again, the only way they could have done this with, is with high heat, where they were able to heat these stones and then, again, just perfectly mold them together, as you can see here, a great example. And we see this all over Mesoamerican sites, Peru, Teotihuacan, Machu Picchu, excuse me. So uh, always in represent representation of their god, either uh, um, Cucu Khan or Quetzalcoatl, there's various you know, gods around South America. Interesting thing to note about their gods is, you know, South American people are usually sharp, shorter, dark skin, dark hair, yet Cucu Khan, Quetzalcoatl, Quetzalcoatl are all uh, light skin, either long white hair, long red hair, nowhere near the, uh, the uh, indigenous people, <laughs> almost extraterrestrial in nature. So what do we also start to see, or I've started to notice, is that there seem to be a conveyance of these, these gods, Quetzalcoatl, Kuku Khan, but many of these other ancient sites seem to be de de uh, depicting, excuse me, uh, a race that influenced the great cultures long in the past that they would consider gods or great ancients. And they all seem to have long slender bodies and their hands are always wrapped at the waist. And I see this around the world from different cultures and I'm, and I'm gonna probably come back to that, but could these be representations of this lost ancient culture? Let's call it the great Atlantean culture, even though it wasn't on one continent, but the great culture that once existed and influenced all the great ancients. They all seem to have a depiction of this long slender character with their hands wrapped at the waist. Okay, again, more evidence of just these intricately cut stones, even going to locations underwater like Yanaguni and various sites where we can date it again 10, 13,000 years ago, water levels and things were a lot different. Doesn't mean that there weren't structures, again, right on the coastlines at that time. Unfortunately, now they're probably underwater. Um, India, um, Asia, a lot of these sites that we're now starting to uncover. Uh, one one was uh, just did with a partner of mine called Ancient Explorers was called uh, uh, Dwarka, 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 excuse me, in India, Dwarka, where there's a huge underground underwater city um, off right off the coast of India there, as well as here at, um, that we see underwater in, in, in uh, various sites in Asia, Yanaguni, for an example. These are clearly step pyramids of some kind. Um, they still haven't been validated. And again, research around them is kind of, you know, not uh, forthcoming uh, or outright. Okay, now again, so when we look at a lot of these newer sites, this is Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, we see these depictions of these characters again. You, I mean, not the best picture, but you can see someone's arm and his hands kind of wrapping into the front here. It's like a long, slender character. Um, all over uh, Gobekli Tepe are these tabs, slabs, if you will, kind of sticking out of the ground and depictions of these long slender characters. I always found them very interesting or various animals and things that were available probably in the, in the region at that time. But when we look around the world, we're starting to see again, a similarity of these long slender beings. And I say long slender beings because here, even on the remotest area on earth, Easter Island, we have again, the same type of a being being depicted. What we thought were just heads, which we call the Moai heads, are actually not just heads when excavated are long slender beings with their hands wrapped at the waist. Um, this unfortunately is a back view of him, but he's actually got his hands wrapped at the waist. So there seems to be a lost epoch of time of understanding uh, when these different beings were around. And it's probably not that they were entirely human, but they might've been not alien in the sense that they were Terra based, but maybe not entirely human. And I just wanna go back to this analogy not the best, uh, some, of the, some of the hieroglyphics or, or images they have here are more animal symbols uh, on the actual figures. But I want to just go back to that example of the mayfly. You know, we live such a short duration of time, 100 years, it's very hard to gauge what the uh, ancients were telling us around this information in understanding that we live a, a, a 100 years out of a 24,000 year cycle that seems to be repeating here on Earth. Now, I'm going to kind of touch on this some more some modern topics as the last part of my lecture. Um, Mars has obviously been in the news with the movie The Martian and some of the things they released out right around the same time of The Martian saying, hey, look, we found 
water on Mars and some of the precursors for life on Mars. I think what we're going to find is a continual proliferation of evidence around Mars. This was some of the first information that I became interested in, and I've been tracking the movements of Mars for quite a long time as far as what we've been doing there. Over the last couple of decades, other agencies, ESA, the Chinese, have also engaged in uh, sending craft to Mars and are watching what's going on. What's really interesting about the imagery and things that we receive telemetry-wise from Mars is that still 80% of this goes through one company based in San Diego called Malin Space Science Systems, meaning Malin, Dr. Dr. Mike Malin is the principal science photographer licensing the technology to NASA to use for the orbital cameras. So all of the imaging processing goes through his departments, classified in most, in most parts, but the public sectors as well. Well, when I was attending college in San Diego, I contacted Dr. Mike Mail and asked him point blank range as a college student about Cydonia, the face and pyramids. And he told me, oh, these are all natural objects, nothing to do with artificial intel intelligence or some ancient culture. So I've been paying attention over the last 20 years since I was in college and asked him those questions and have noticed a track record of how we're slowly building up this information to release to the public. Now, it's not that there's a cover up at NASA. There's been an engineer at NASA working there for 16 years and he developed an arm that's gonna go on the next orbiter and it's gonna dip into the dirt and look for amino acids, right? So he's building a science project or an objective around that. We don't have any instrumentation going on any of the orbiters or landers that's gonna actually scoop up some life and confirm. So there's a political backup to us actually confirming life. But let's be clear, folks, there's also a cover up too. I just wanna be clear about it. Okay. So you can see that for a long time, we've been looking at Mars, even since Schiaparelli, where he said, there's canali all over Mars, right? Waterways all over Mars. No, there's no waterways all over Mars. That's exactly what he was seeing. Mars today is exactly what Schiaparelli thought in the late 1800s, is that it's actually inundated with a lot of an ancient, you know, at one point was probably teeming with life. So the evidence that we have today on Mars is slowly coming out that there's still something going on on Mars, which allows us for quite a bit of uh, evidence to say, yes, there's probably life today. Now, NASA has been photographing the surface of Mars for quite a long time. Some of these newer agencies have just got into the game. And we can see here, ESA, the European Space Agency, takes their images in color. And this one patch called the Gusev Crater you can see which looks very much possibly like vegetation. Now NASA takes the same swath of the Gusev crater and shows you this in black and white. ESA, this. NASA, this. NASA won't acknowledge that this is actually vegetation of some sort, but if you go through the NASA archives, we start to find some very interesting data, folks. All over the surface of Mars, there are patches of standing water standing vegetation, some type of plant life, whether it's bacterial based or, uh, or chlorophyll based, I don't know. But as you're gonna see, there is life in that form all over Mars. And even since the 70s, here's snow from the Viking orbiter in the 70s, snow all over the surface of Mars. And all of the images that you see of Mars being super red, the images that we take from the surface of Mars are taking a larger spectrum of light than what the human eye can see. If you color correct it for RGB of what the eye sees, this behind this live press conference is what the actual eye would see on Mars. Very rarely do they color correct it for you. It's just a red planet. No, no, it's a blue, just like kind of more like us. They just have a much weaker atmosphere. That's what Mars looks like if you're standing on the surface. So all over Mars, we're starting to find out that there's a very watery past, even salt water, standing salt water all over the surface of Mars. Here's a clear satellite image of standing water on Mars right now. Here's a lake on Mars right now. If you think I'm joking, folks, I'm not. What's funny about this is that if you pair this up to a, G, to a, a Google map and look at a lake bed from, from a satellite view, it doesn't look much different from Earth than from Mars. But folks, these are all standing water with some type of, I would assume, chlorophyll-based, bacterial-based plant life collecting around these pools of water. 
And so here's a comparison of what you would see from Google Maps and also on Mars. And that is literally from the surface of Mars. And most of these images can be found in any of the mainland space science systems archives. So over and over again, I find these images of what appear to me to be literally pools of water on Mars and vegetation growing around these locations. And some of these sites on the surface of Mars almost represent what if you maybe brushed away the dirt and took some tractors out there or something, to me it looked like the same Google Maps view of Inca cities here on Earth. Maybe there's some type of connection. But a lot of these sites under Google Maps view can be compared to satellite imagery of Mars and seeing that there is some type of connection or similarity to these locations. So all over Mars, we have what appear to be not just random things, but if you look closer at this cliffside, you can see that there could be small edifices or things that are pharaonic in nature, or just like there's things here in Egypt of pyramids and, and a large sculpted face into the Sphinx. Maybe all over Mars, we will find these types of artifacts and connections as well. And there, there does seem to be a connection between what we see with the lion-esque views of the Sphinx edifice and a lot of the pyramidal structures and finding these same, same types of things uh, in a region on Mars called Cydonia. Here in Egypt, we can see in uh, one area of Abydos, they have these wall reliefs, which are still under uh, scrutiny as being older reliefs covering up newer reliefs. So these aren't really a helicopter and spaceships, but maybe they are. All of the ancients have these conveyances of the actual gods traveling between the planets. Now, here's an actual conveyance of one god of Earth, the seven dots and the crescent moon, the god of Earth, using the queen disc, a conveyance of flight, conveying to the fish god on Mars or the conveyance of a man on Mars. So it's very interesting. And you can see below them, there's this dolphin symbol in the lower part of the, the uh, tablet. These are actually shown as symbolic references on various parts of Mars on the ground. So, these references from the Sumerian culture, having the references, having the ability for the references of the, of the power of flight, I don't think it's just a symbolic reference to say that, you know, they had wings. I think it's to say that they literally had the power of flight. And so a lot of that is being shown in not only Earth-based artifacts, but some of these locations as we start to send probes and things to the other planets, look into these dark craters, who knows what we're going to find. Um, I kind of like to allude to that movie, uh, Stargate, where we uh, kind of find the Stargate and jet to another dimension. I guess only time is going to tell. But uh, the Sphinx, as you can see, was once very much buried up. And only recently, over the last, you know, since our lifetime, 60, 70 years, that we uncovered it and kind of opened it up for history to appreciate. But there's still quite a bit of history out there. Um, that we have yet to uncover. And you can look on Google Maps and see sites even in Giza, around Giza, that have yet to be excavated. So quite interesting. Now, if you look at the geological evidence of the inner walls of the Sphinx, you can see massive erosion. There's been massive amounts of erosion that have been you know, happening on the inner walls of the Sphinx. So um, this could have only taken place with massive amounts of rain or water gushing over the sides of the walls. And the last time there were rains like that was probably the, you know, the Great Flood 10,000 years ago. So more than likely the Sphinx, again, is a much older edifice, the pyramids as well. And again, under satellite uh, analysis, we can see that their alignments and things uh, are just way too much of a precision to have been just by chance aligning to the Orion constellation. And under other cultures seem to uh, reference this as well, where they take the Orion constellation's knowledge and create monuments on the ground seem to be emulating this uh, constellation for some reason. Now, a uh, few scholars have done quite a bit of work in looking at these ancient cultures. I'd like to at least acknowledge them. Zachariah Sitchin, also Graham Hancock, looking at more of the Egyptian connection, looking at the astronomical connections, both uh, great scholars. I think as we continue to look at Mars, we're in for quite a bumpy ride of information. Um, this will probably be the first location where they validate life other than Earth existing. Um, I think everyone that's familiar with the Cydonia region can see that there's an area on Mars that was once occupied. And uh, when we look at this a little bit closer, 
um, you can see that this is something that hasn't been called out. But if you look at where the face is and these structures that I've labeled pyramidal structure and four and pyramidal structure down at the bottom, you notice that the image, just pull back and look at the image on your screen for a moment. The left side is bright, knobby terrain, and the right side mellows out to where the face is to more mellow, non knobby terrain. Almost as if you, if you look at where the terrain change between that left and right side is, you can see an ancient shoreline. And that's exactly what it is, folks. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. But all of these structures are not only positioned towards each other in the right way, they were actually positioned in such a way that the culture at that time was able to appreciate them mathematically, but also visually. Uh, Richard Hoagland did a great job. There's a couple of videos you can probably get on Netflix or on uh, you know, Apple TV, where he really gets into the math behind the Cydonia region. And looking at not only the face, but the surrounding structures around these uh, various objects. Um, and some, uh, you know, believe that there is literally this ancient city on Mars known as Cydonia. Now, sorry, what's, what I've really found interesting, as I mentioned, is that these structures appear to be right on an ancient shoreline, where if you look at this closely, you can see these objects that look to be pyramids are positioned right on what would be an ancient shoreline. And the face would be out in the water like a monument. I mean, it's very much today like how everyone likes to live on waterfront property. We can see a clear geological delineation between the land and the water side, right down the middle of the image, making it to be some type of an ancient shoreline. And the land seems to encompass all of those structures. So it makes sense, right? Like even today, everyone likes to live on waterfront property. So it's very possible that Cydonia was built. Thank you so much. Was built here. Let me take this. Was built in such a way so that you're able to actually see things um, from the land, just like we have, like the Washington Monument or the Statue of Liberty, surrounded by water. Okay. Now, I'm going to start to wrap it up here, folks. But my point around the face is that you know NASA took this picture in the early 70s, early 70s with the Viking Orbiter and the live feed. They labeled this image that you see here in raw data as head and said, oh, it's a trick of light and shadow. And a few hours later, we imaged this with the satellite and the shadow was gone. It was no longer a face. <whistles> Wrong answer. It turns out that not only was this face imaged by different satellite passes, but at different sun angles, it still always looks like a face. And here's the worst picture they ever took of the face and watch the data that I'm able to extract from it. If you take the worst image that they, that they took from the Mars Global Surveyor in 1998, Art Bell, a famous radio talk show host, called this the cat box image. It looks like a cat just scratched up the face. But if you take this image and rotate it so that it's looking at you head on, split it down the middle, you actually get some really interesting data. Now, one side that's really badly eroded, you can still see facial features. But that left side, if we take that and mirror it, just like any human face, if you look at yourself in half a mirror, you still look like yourself because we're asymmetrical. Well, this, this isn't by chance, folks, that what we're seeing on the face on Mars is asymmetrical features on just that left side that's less eroded that are just not found in nature, right? We see Egyptian headdress. We see what looks like lion-like facial features. We see a symmetrical face having eyes, nose, and a mouth. This just can't be by chance. So I think a lot of these things, when we look at the face and pyramids under higher scrutiny, we can see that they actually do pass a lot of these scientific tests, like looking at it from any three-dimensional angle. There's another gentleman who I highly recommend outside of Dr. Richard Hoagland. Uh, sorry, sorry. Outside of Richard Hoagland is a gentleman named Dr. Mark Carlotto, who is an imaging specialist and wrote algorithms to look at satellite telemetry, where you run his algorithm on a satellite image of, of, of uh, Russia, and he could tell you, oh, those are troops being hidden by uh, patterns, you know, or those are tanks being covered up by a tarp. So when he ran his mathematical algorithms on the face and pyramids, the face and pyramids all came out as hits to be over 98% probability to be artificial. So all of that mathematical fractal analysis that he could prove on satellite telemetry from Russia worked the same way as it did on the face and pyramids on Mars. NASA never came forth with any of this type of data, yet anyone can do the, the analysis for themselves, as I did, 
that there's enough evidence in the public sector from good researchers like Dr. Mark Carlotto to validate that there is an artificial intelligence that has somehow left a marker on Mars, let alone here on Earth. I mean, we're looking at Mars and trying to figure stuff out. We got stuff all over our own planet. So just kind of wrapping it up there, Mark Carlotto's information is definitely a great source of information to look at when trying to validate further missions as we go to Mars and understanding how we can hold accountable NASA and the space agencies. Uh, NASA has had quite a long duration of protocols since in its inception, since the Brookings report released its report about what do we do if we find aliens? Uh, you know, it's, they, they've always mandated quarantine. And that's not always the best procedure. I think it's more uh, going to be a, up to us as the public sector starts to find new ways through SpaceX launch, successful launch today, and various other drone technology we're going to start to spend, send into the solar system. It's going to be a little bit harder over the next decade uh, for the Department of Defense to lock out public access to the solar system. So stay tuned, folks. We're definitely in for an interesting ride as some of these old standing traditions change. And uh, maybe as we eventually go to Mars, we're going to find things there that make us realize we have a much richer history. OK, I'm going to wrap it up there and I'll spend, unfortunately, since we went kind of long here, I'm going to spend about five minutes and I'll look at your comments or I'll, I'll coordinate with Neil to answer anything that I can. Thank you so much, folks. I hope this was helpful for you. Thank you.